Jonathan will tell you a little bit about his uh, background of um, doing some of the SCADA engineering and now actually going out and actually um, talking and um, uh, presenting on this topic. So without further ado, Jonathan. Hey, thanks. Okay, so as a quick background, uh, I started as a SCADA engineer for Chevron back in the 90s. So I was programming a lot of these SCADA systems back then and then switched over to the cybersecurity side. And since 2001, we've been involved in doing security assessments and rolling out mediation strategies for uh, SCADA systems. So this is our core capabilities and core services. And we speak about probably 15 to 20 times a year usually at SCADA conferences about cybersecurity. So we thought this year would be good to talk about SCADA at a cybersecurity conference. And as we walk through here, the next hour of your life, what we want to do is basically, first of all, just define the electric grid and how it works, from power generation to power transmission to power distribution to the home, so that everyone gets on the same page and understands what we're talking about as far as the topic. Then we're going to talk about our assessment approach that we use to conduct security assessments of this infrastructure. Uh, we've done about 120 security assessments over the past nine years, and of those, probably half were done in the electric sector. And then uh, lastly, we're going to actually go through a database of vulnerabilities that we have collected over the last nine years and kind of mine that information for trends. So these are a couple of quotes you guys have probably have seen in the media. Uh, cybersecurity is a big deal, and it's even a bigger deal for SCADA systems because it controls critical infrastructure. And what we found and what you'll see through this uh, presentation is that SCADA systems are far less secure than enterprise IT systems. And it used to be back in the 90s when these systems ran on serial protocols, 9600 baud, uh, it wasn't on Ethernet. A lot of the systems weren't connected to Ethernet systems that you could hide behind obscurity, right? You can say, well, this protocol is not really known by a lot of people. This system is proprietary to a specific vendor. In fact, I can remember uh, working with a lot of the different vendors, and each vendor had their own color coding system. So, for instance, if you worked with a Siemens system, you had to buy everything from Siemens, their software package, their cables, you had to use their Profibus protocol. Everything was down the line with that vendor. And what happened in the uh, late 90s, early 2000 years, uh, a lot of the asset owners said, you know, I have a lot of different infrastructure. I have Siemens, I have Yokogawa, Honeywell, Invensys, and they all have to work together. So uh, they pushed for open standards, TCP IP, leveraging Microsoft-based systems, and so that's kind of how we got to the point we are today. So nowadays, uh, you know, all you have to do is really just open up a Google search engine and just start typing in stuff about SCADA and you'll find it. Uh, just do your own homework. You'll find that uh, on the first page of hits, you can download the whole Modbus protocol specification. You can download uh, fuzzing hacking tools. And actually, uh, hacking and fuzzing SCADA is pretty simplistic. Uh, a lot of the protocols are in the clear, so you don't really have to even decrypt what you're looking at. And uh, as recently as this month, we saw the first uh, introduction of malware that was actually written to uh, exploit SCADA specifically. We've had in the past um, malware such as like the SQL Slammer Worm that was written not to impact SCADA systems, it was written for SQL Server. However, it did impact a lot of SCADA systems back in 2004 uh, because a lot of SCADA systems use SQL Server uh, as part of their components. But this was really the first time we actually saw uh, a targeted attack towards SCADA. And uh, also, if you remember that little uh, advanced persistent threat problem that we're starting to see on the corporate side, uh, guess what? It's also creeping down into the SCADA side. So we've had some customers uh, call us and say, uh, someone is moving this mouse on our screens and we don't know who it is. And that's pretty scary. So what we want to do is first talk about, are we winning the cyber war? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's hard to when we're asleep. When we go through these slides, you guys are probably going to chuckle because uh, I think that it's, it's, hopefully this is a wake-up call for those of us that work in the security profession, especially those that work in critical infrastructure roles, especially with important stuff. So uh, we just really step up. It's time for us to step up the game for sure. So first of all, let's learn how this stuff works. So what we did was we took the electric utility vertical 
and we're going to break down power generation, power transmission, power distribution. And again, a little disclaimer, the diagrams that we're using here, this is not any particular diagrams from any particular system. Uh, I generated these diagrams myself based on what a typical power generation, transmission, and distribution system looks like. This actually came right off the NERC website. So power is generated, then transmitted, and then distributed to the home, and I want to break down each one for you. And uh, all of these diagrams, all of this stuff is in the white paper as well as the slides that's in your uh, CD. So if you look at a typical power generation system, uh, this is where your, your first line of defense is, the uh, internet firewall. And then there's typical corporate systems that you would find just like any other IT system on the corporate side. And then there's uh, master DCS firewalls, which DCS is distributive control systems. And uh, the DCS firewall uh, is then the this, this second tier of defense when you get down into the SCADA systems that uh, manage the generation of power. And then uh, down in the DCS system is where you have industrial switches. Uh, these are not typically by Cisco or Juniper. This is typically by Garrettcom, Ruggedcom, other vendors that actually specialize in developing ruggedized industrial switches. And then those switches connect all of the various distributed control components together over TCP IP. So when you break this down, your first choke point is the internet choke point. And uh, when typically we've been hired to conduct penetration testing, the, we find that the internet firewall is pretty well hardened. A lot of the security professionals that are, uh, their, their job is to defend the internet border have done a pretty good job. Uh, the problem lies when you start getting into the corporate side. Uh, and then when you plug your laptop into the corporate side and act as if you're a corporate employee, at that point it's very simplistic to find the gateway into the SCADA system. A lot of the SCADA systems have uh, common protocols, common ports open, uh, common fingerprinting schemes that you can see that this is a data historian or this is an operational web server that's serving up real-time data from the plant. And you follow the trail and you'll, get, you'll find yourself down in the SCADA systems themselves. And what we find is that second layer of defense is typically very weak uh, because there's a lot of holes opened up for communication between the SCADA systems and the corporate systems. And there's also requirements to send real-time data out to um, the local, uh, the regional entities that have to manage load generation across the region. So uh, this is what a typical generation system looks like. Next, let's talk about power transmission. So once the power is generated, uh, there's also a requirement to uh, do energy management and ensure that the energy that's being put out over the wires is managed properly. Now, these systems are a little bit different, uh, and so not all SCADA systems are alike. So one point to take home is that you know, SCADA systems are almost like snowflakes. They're all different. Even if you look at one power transmission system and you go to look at another power transmission system, they're going to be different because they're designed specifically for that installation of that system. But in tip typically what you'll find is a, the same type of an approach, an internet firewall, the corporate system, and then an EMS, energy management system, layer of firewalls protecting the energy management systems themselves. And in this uh, middle layer, middle tier, before you actually get down into the substation controls, you'll find a lot of interesting things like outage management systems, GIS systems, which is uh, basically allowing them to uh, locate where all the different parts of their infrastructure are, are geo-spaced and located. Uh, and then you also see weather systems. Uh, the weather has a big impact on how you transmit energy over the transmission lines. So there's a lot of interconnectivity from outside sources that are based on the internet uh, back into the control room environment. And so there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done to ensure that those systems that need data from the internet are not also connected to the systems that get live feeds from the SCADA system. All right, so it's an important, uh, getting the architecture right is, is the first part. Uh, and then if you push yourself down, uh, there's typically a primary control system and backup control system. Both of these uh, backup and primary systems are connected to all of the substations. Uh, now, the very critical components are those that can actually remotely, from a click of a mouse, disconnect large chunks of load, right? And so that's the, this stuff is very important. Uh, that's why the NERC SIP uh, regulations came about that said you need to define your perimeters around this stuff, know what's in those perimeters, know what ports and services are open, and harden those systems. And uh, it is a wake-up call because a lot of these systems aren't hardened to the, to the area where they need to be. And uh, let's go to the next level. 
uh, from transmission, then you get down into distribution of power down to the neighborhoods and large uh, industrial customers. So again, a common type of feel you'll, you'll get here is uh, an internet connection point through the corporate layers down into the DMS systems, distribution management systems. Now these systems are very similar to EMS systems, it's just that they're controlling uh, low distribution at a lower level. So instead of at like 100 kV and higher, which would be uh, typically the uh, transmission systems, distribution systems handles distribution at a smaller load at 67 kV or lower. Uh, the same concepts are there. They, they need to uh, have connectivity to their outage management systems, uh, trading systems, marketing systems, load shedding in case there's a, a problem with the amount of load on the grid. Uh, these systems have the ability to shed load. Uh, there's also connections to building systems because now that you're getting down into the distribution of power to homes and businesses, and now you need to actually start thinking about how do you track the usage of that electricity and bill off of it. And that's where the smart grid comes into place. AMR systems, automated metering reading systems, or AMI systems, is the next step. So uh, the last 10, 20 years, we saw a progression of meter reading systems from where a guy walks out to your home periodically and reads it manually to the point where they had some low uh, uh, RF systems to, uh, so where they would send a truck into the neighborhood and as a truck rolled through the neighborhood, it would collect the data off the meters. Uh, to the point to where now they want to even extend the automation to the point where the meters are always connected, always on, and, and being able to read data from the home or from the business 24-7. Uh, uh, and I will talk about smart grid and smart metering systems at the end of the presentation about some of the vulnerabilities we've seen with those systems. But the key things to keep in mind is that distribution management systems uh, have, do have the capability of shedding large chunks of load. Uh, and those systems can be interconnected back up through the internet. So uh, making sure that these systems have the right security precautions in place uh, is, is definitely uh, the right thing to do. And as we walk through here, um, I'm going to then talk about uh, the methodology we use to look at uh, vulnerabilities, to discover vulnerabilities, and then I'm going to give you a whole set of statistics on what we've actually discovered over the past nine years. Um, the next question is, if these systems are all different, then how do we come up with common cybersecurity standards for SCADA? Uh, especially when you know, uh, FERC and NERC manages the, the security rules and regulations around securing the power systems, but then you have DHS that, that manages the compliance regulations around chemicals and water and all the other critical sectors. So there's not really a common body that's looking at SCADA security across all the critical infrastructure sectors. Um, what we found is that if you do a little bit of research, uh, the NERC CIP standards, and you cross-reference those with the ISA S99 standard, which ISA is the International Society of Automation, you'll see that there's a common uh, framework of security controls across the board. Uh, one of the things that ISA S99 laid out was this concept of security levels, starting at the things that are most important. Uh, the inputs and outputs and sensors and plant equipment controls. If you're down at that level, you can actually um, open valves, close valves, open disconnect switches, turn on power, turn off power. That's down at level one. And as you work your way up through the infrastructure, you get all the way up to level five. And it, as you transgress each of these levels, you have to have proper security controls in place. But at least now we have a model to start going by for how to look at security controls for critical infrastructure. So now let me kind of uh, transition into the methodology that we've developed over the past nine years, uh, nine or ten years, is that you really can't just point, click, and run automated vulnerability scanners in this, in, in this type of infrastructure. And I'll, I'll show you why. I have some screenshots of what some of the equipment has done when, when this stuff is done to it, uh, especially when you put it on a, a bench and try to slam it with a lot of different tools. Uh, they have a tendency to reboot and do weird things, we come back, try to reboot with a, our incorrect configuration. So uh, the approach that we like to take is a very logical, layered approach where you start with the physical security of these assets and work your way all the way down to the field devices that actually are doing the control of the system. And we like to use a defense in depth approach so that the physical security, the fencing, the video surveillance, that's protecting physical ac access to the systems. 
Then once you're on the wire, the network infrastructure switches routers far.